everyone, Terry Welbrock here, host of the Healing Place podcast, and just wanted to share some quick announcements before today's wonderful episode. Um, the audiobook production. That's so exciting. I'm in book number four right now. Um, the first two books, The Energy Medicine Solution, Mind-Blowing Results for Living an Extraordinary Life, written by Jacqueline M. Cain, uh, as well as The Wellness Woman, A Guide to Holistic Health and Happiness, uh, written by Carrie Hendricks. Both are out in the world of Audible, so go check those out. You can look up Terry Welbrock uh, in order to find both of those. Probably the easiest, uh, the easiest way to do so. Um, and if you go to my Facebook page, uh, Facebook The Healing Place Podcast, there are posts that I'm putting out. Uh, you can just scroll back through the posts and find uh, either of those books and you can find some links if you are not yet on Audible. Um, another quick exciting announcement is that I went to pop on my host, Blueberry, uh, my hosting site the other day and noticed that the podcast had jumped from being downloaded in 125 countries to 134 countries. Um, it's not listed um, what are the new countries, so I would have to go back and, and really do some digging. But So nine countries, people in nine different countries uh, have found this show, so yay! I'm so excited. Um, I joined uh, previous podcast guest Michael Andre Ford on his show. If you go to YouTube to Michael Andre Ford, um, he has an Angels Positivity and Love show, Angels Positivity and Love, and so my interview with him will be coming up as a guest on his show October 15th, so mark that on your calendars. It was a beautiful, wonderful interview, uh, conversation. And then what else is on my, on my list? Um, the podcast, the Healing Place podcast has some new badges have been awarded. Um, some of the ones that I've had and, and uh, been sharing with folks, over 100,000 listeners, uh, been podcasting s over six years now. Holy moly. That's so amazing. Um, global reach, obviously, in 134 countries. Uh, now over 300, I think I'm like at 310 episodes uh, published. Um, and still working to bring in monetization and sponsors. So if you are listening and want to sponsor this show and have a healing product or um, an offering and want to be a sponsor, please uh, go to my website, terrywellbrock.com, and you can go to um, the Donate Now tab, and that brings up sponsorship opportunities. Uh, been doing affiliate partnerships, so working with the Shift Network, uh, doing some affiliate work and sharing their programs, which are just amazing, as well as the Gupta program, which I utilize myself, some amazing meditations. Um, so again, you can always reach out to me at uh, info at terrywellbrock.com. That's my email for the show, uh, info at terrywellbrock.com. And ask me about any of these things. Um, I'm always, always open to hearing from folks. So uh, if you want information about the Gupta program, about the Shift Network, um, I've also just started a Creator Connector campaign through Amazon, uh, through my affiliate link with Amazon. And so I'll be putting a lot of products out. Um, I'm thinking about creating a page on my website for it uh, and keep it rolling and updated. Uh, but certainly on the Facebook page, um, you can find products I've used personally or products that I've researched uh, that will help you along your healing journey. Um, oh, the Healing Place Podcast. If you go to Feedspot, uh, 90 Best Healing Podcasts, the Healing Place Podcast is number six. Woohoo! So, yeah, 90 Best Healing Podcasts. So exciting. Um, and finally, the last thing is uh, five star reviews. If you love the show, um, and would write a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That would be so amazing. Um, I would love to hit 100 by year end. Right now, I think I'm at 50-something, uh, or maybe 60. I think I'm over 60. 
Um, yeah, that would be so fantastic. So go to Apple Podcasts, find the Healing Place Podcast, and uh, write a review and uh, or leave a ranking. That would be fantastic. Just, uh, again, so very grateful that you're here and part of this, inviting others to listen and helping this show just continue to blossom and grow. So, all right, today's amazing, beautiful, wonderful inspirational chat with a previous podcast guest who's joining me to share some exciting news. All right, now for the show. Welcome everybody to the Healing Place podcast. I'm your host, Terry Wellbrock, and always doing my happy dance, but doing another one again, because today I have Diane Petrella with me. She has been with me, I think twice before on the show, maybe three times. So this is just such a gift to have her back again, but for a very, very exciting reason. So let me read her intro. Diane Petrella, MSW, is a holistic licensed psychotherapist in private practice, specializing in the psychological effects of childhood trauma, emotional eating, body image issues, and grief. So welcome, Diane, or welcome back. (laughs) Thank you, Terry. Thank you for being here. It's always a pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. And I'm I'm just very, very excited to talk about, hold on, I'm going to hold it up for those watching video because I don't have the actual one in my hand because it's not ready yet, but ooh, oh, great. Look at that. So Diane has, uh, is releasing a book, the launch is coming up, Healing Emotional Eating for Trauma Survivors. So yeah, let's talk about your, your big, exciting news. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. It'll be published on September 1st uh, by New Harbinger Publications. Um, And the subtitle is Trauma-Informed Practices to Nurture a Peaceful Relationship with Your Emotions, Body, and Food, which kind of encapsulates everything. Um, Yeah, I'm very excited about it. It's really been a labor of love and kind of the culmination of a lot of the work I've done as a psychotherapist over the years. Yeah, well, I know we have certainly I've I've witnessed your journey on on creating this and and writing it and finding the right publisher and the right fit and it really is a journey to get a book out. It's not like, oh hey, I think I'll write a book and write it and then, you know, all of a sudden magically all these publishers appear that want to want to publish it. Right. I'm very happy with New Harbinger. They've been wonderful and you know, I knew that there was a need for this kind of a book. There, there are wonderful books on emotional eating. There are wonderful books on trauma. And I wanted to put together something that's a, a book and a program to help people get to the root cause for those who've been traumatized growing up in childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, perhaps, because it's futile to address emotional eating if you're not addressing the root cause and where some of the 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 deeper aspects of the triggers come from. So this is a book that where I put that together for people in a way that I believe is accessible and easy to follow and easy to read and um, with a lot of compassion and support and encouragement along the way. Which is much needed for us trauma survivors. I know, I know you and I had talked about once before in one of our conversations, uh, I know COVID certainly had an an impact on me because with the lockdowns and, you know, a lot of the social, social isolation, I was finding myself, uh, before I started to have my physical issues, um, from mycotoxin poisoning, but standing Mm -hmm. in front of the pantry, looking for solace in whatever snack I could dive into. Um, and so I think that has, that really kind of came to the surface for a lot of people is that they realized they were, falling into that emotional eating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you talked about the solace, it's really not about the food. The food offers comfort for that solace. But for certainly many of the people I work with, the solace they're experiencing in the here and now sort of reverberations of emotional isolation, earlier pain, earlier self-worth issues, earlier abandonment or rejection issues that comes to the surface and can be triggered, but not necessarily about what's going on today. Today, I'm not trying to minimize COVID. That was this extraordinary experience we were all experiencing. I realized that. And if somebody experienced early trauma and used food to cope, 
it was just going to exacerbate them. Again, because of the current issue at that time, COVID, but what it would bring up from the past in those places where it may not have been the places that still needed healing and attention and love and compassion um, that gives you an opportunity to heal, address those issues and heal on an even deeper level. Yeah. And that makes so much sense because as soon as you said it, I said, oh, for sure. I mean, sugar was my thing to, to wrap myself in as a kid when growing up in, in the environment that I grew up in, I craved those, uh, I would, I would ride my bike up to the store to get the candy bar and get the soda and get the bag of Doritos and whatever it is. And then sit in front of the little black and white TV, losing myself in the Brady Bunch or <laughs> whatever TV show was on and just shoving this stuff into my face. You're with your friends. You know, a lot of people look at food when they were growing up or even now is, is their friends that, that are, is always there for them. And, you know, when you talked about how you felt when you were a child, one of the, I have a chapter in the book just on feelings, processing your feelings because, and it's hard to, for people to sometimes understand this, but what you're feeling today in a way to help heal emotional eating is to address the sadness, the fear, the anger, whatever the trigger may be that leads one to use food or another substance too, is about looking at where that originated from. It's kind of like the aftershocks of an earthquake. There's the first earthquake, which might be a one-time trauma. It might be, as for many of the clients I've worked with, with complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which means it's more ongoing trauma that affects the development of a child and teenager's life and how they see themselves and brain functioning and so many aspects of their um, the way they're in the world. So there's a technique I talk about, a feelings bridge, where you look at, it's a, you may have been triggered to eat, that's one issue, fine, no judgment, but to take a look at what that feeling was as if you're going back in time and it's an imagery exercise and you access either the very first time you can recall that or one of the first times that you felt the same way. You might've been an eight-year-old, 12-year-old, a four-year-old. Most people can identify a time they felt that way earlier in their life because there are certain predominant emotions that we all tend to re-experience um, obviously we're human beings with a wide range of, of, of emotions, but when somebody has been traumatized, they may have some key feelings, anger, sadness, abandonment that get triggered more often. They're more predominant. And there may be a, a, a shorter range of an emotional expression that they're able to access. So the feeling bridge technique, it, it's actually a hypnosis technique that I learned decades ago when I was trained in hypnosis as well. Um, by a man, James Watkins, if I'm remembering his name correctly, the affect bridge, he called it. But it's going back in time. And then once you're able to access that child and the image of the child that one was, to see yourself as the adult that you are, giving love and attention and care to that child. It could be a simple hug using imagery. Imagine yourself hugging that child, um, talking to them, telling them it's going to be okay. But taking the feeling out of at, honoring it for where how you're feeling it today but really looking at where that first earthquake so to speak came from because this is one of the aftershocks and that can continue and reverberate throughout one's lifetime until it's healed from where it started and it may not be healed completely and that's okay people may always feel it to some degree but feeling it with 20 or 30 percent intensity versus 80 90 or 100 is very different you can manage your life that way um so that's one of the ways of getting to the root cause of emotional healing healing obviously you have to deal with what's going on today but the deeper healing comes from connecting earlier on i also um within my book and in the beginning i talk about connecting with your wise self, which people may call that your soul, your spirit, 
I just call it your wise self, which is that part of you that we all have that's all wise, all knowing, all loving. It's more spiritual than religious, but people may have some religious ways of looking at that as well. In fact, in the book, there are four audios that people can access. There, um, there'd be a link in the page or, or yeah, the, the address for the link in the page. And one is on accessing your wise self. And it's a beautiful audio because, or guided imagery exercise really to help you access the wise self. And you can use that through the book because that's where you're going to find your answers. There's all this information is important and necessary. And I like to emphasize to people that you have all the answers inside of you. It's really hard to access that sometimes when you've been traumatized because of the ways you've needed to cope, deny your own feelings, deny your intuition, just to survive in a family perhaps where you weren't noticed for who you are. Um, so there's that exercise that can also help you heal those earlier feelings, access your wise self to give that little child and yourself the comfort you needed at the time. It could be a really oh. powerful experience. I want to, I'm ready to listen to it. That's so awesome. I love connecting with my wise self because you're right. As I, as I did my healing work, then I was finally able to just silence all the old tape, tape loops that were going on and the other voices from people that had been in my life, parents and so forth with, with messages that I didn't need to listen to anymore. Uh, and, and really connect with that. Yes. My, my wise self. Well, I really see, see it as um, that's why one of the, re, one of the ways in which I see myself as a holistic psychotherapist it, you know, connecting with our intuition is so powerful and connecting with our body wisdom. Oh, I'd like to share this too. Um, there's a whole chapter on um, connecting with your body and, and some strat suggestions that I have about that, some techniques and strategies. There's also another audio, which is helping you connect with your, uh, and they're very brief and easy to listen to and then go about your day. Um, this one is about connecting with your body wisdom specifically around ask, it's a great way to start your day, asking your body, what do you need from me today? So you will feel loved and well cared for. And because with emotional eating, body imagery issues, um, feeling comfortable with one's body often goes hand in hand, not always, but it's a, it can be a complimentary challenge, so to speak. And I talk about that in the book, but also in this audio, even if you don't hear anything right away, because it may take time, if it's been hard to connect with your body, just beginning to ask the question and think about what it's like for, for you, for any of us as human beings, when somebody asks, what do you need today? What can I do to show you how much I love and appreciate you? Oh my goodness, isn't that, don't you just feel like alive and loved and cherished? It's the same with our bodies. We seem to forget that our bodies are, it's a real live organic uh, being and energy and, and it's our best friend and, or it would be nice if it's our best friend. It's certainly gonna be with us until we're not here anymore. So when you ask your body what it needs, after a while you'll hear. It could be, I need rest or I need to go for a walk or I need to eat a particular food. Whatever you hear, honor it. Just honor it. Just like if somebody asked you what you wanted and then they forget about it, you're kind of feeling dismissed. Your body will feel dismissed too. It's important to think of your body in the same way that you would think about a living, breathing relationship you have with a person. Um, and beginning to access our body wisdom and connecting with your body and asking it what it, it needs is another aspect of healing emotional eating. Yes. And I have learned to do that too. And it is so awesome and amazing. But I love that you added something I'm going to add to what I say now. I just would will ask my body when I'm meditating or if I'm in an Epsom salt bath and doing just some mindfulness and breath work, I'll just say, okay, body, I put my hand on my heart. What is it that you need today? But I love that you added the part of that will make you help you feel loved and yeah, what do you need from me today so that you will feel loved and well cared for? Yeah. That's beautiful. And it's, wow. and it's simple, isn't it? It's simple. 
and it's it goes deep for what your body needs. Um, and even if you're emotionally eating and had an episode of emotionally eating, ask your body afterwards what it needs. Maybe your body, you might hear that your body needs you to not talk badly about it or to not talk badly about yourself. But it's a powerful exercise to use all the time because our bodies carry so much wisdom and guidance about just how to live our lives. And it's always there to wanting to take care of us as well. And we need to take care of it, obviously. Yeah. I had something that popped into my head and I, I, and it's kind of going backwards a little bit in our conversation, but I was just, it's just a total curiosity from, from personal (laughs) viewpoint. So when you talk about going back in time, because as you spoke, I went back to a place uh, we're talking about the feelings bridge, right? And, and I, I, my, my brain flashed back to a time where standing in the kitchen, you know, for those who listened to the show for a long time, you know my mother was um, a severe alcoholic. And um, so our, our pantries were bare of anything other than things she enjoyed to eat that she liked that she had. And so um, we would say, mom, you, you know, you buy us some Oreos or buy us some Twinkies or, you know, like buy us a treat. And we just never really had it. And so what happened was I would go to my best friend's house and her mom was this gentle, sweet, adorable, kind, loving little lady. And she would say to me, Terry, I went to the grocery and I filled up your cabinet with all the little Debbie treats. And I would open this and be like, oh, it was just like heaven because it was the Nutty Buddies and the zebra cakes and all the all the joyous stuff. And I felt loved by the food that she gave me or that she offered. And so to me, it was instead of having like well, I guess it would be the sadness part of it related to my mom, but it was connected with this joyous part of it. So would you really want to address both of those things, I guess? I would suspect that there is the joy of it and how sweet she had a a shelf for you or it was the family shelf that she was saying was yours too, which is just so beautiful. You were part of their family. I would suspect that, you know, sometimes people think that emotional eating can in part anyway stem from earlier in someone's life, food or an ice cream cone or things were used to celebrate. And that's how people get into a pattern of emotional eating. I don't believe that. Okay. When there's enough love, when there's enough support, when there's enough acknowledgement of who a child is, when their fears are, um, you know, when, when there's support around their fear, when they're protected through their fears. And there might be a special treat of food or, a, a, a you know, a, a pantry of all these treats, these Debbie treats you were talking about. That will enhance the love that's already there. If it's not there, it's not going to replace it. It gives momentary relief because of all the ways it also soothes and calms one's body. You had the additional relief, which is beautiful. It sounds like your friend's mother was such a godsend to you. Yes. So yes, with joy. If you went home, Terry, to a home, to a family, where you had an equal amount of joy and support and attention, it wouldn't result in, I don't believe, in food being used in the same way for somebody. Does Thank you for sense? clarifying. That makes, yes. And that that's what I was hoping that you would come back with because um, yes, it makes absolute sense. So yes. Thank you so much for You're that welcome. clarification. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with having, you know, if a child had a sad day, I actually think there's an example like this in my book and a mother says, come talk about it. You know, I'm going to get some ice cream. Let's have some ice cream. Tell me why you're sad. A child isn't going to start emotionally eating and using ice cream in the same way as if they came home to an empty house and grabbed the ice cream because there was nobody to talk to about being bullied at school 
because maybe a parent was an emotionally unavailable or addicted or whatever the problems are. But having a parent talk to you and address all your sadness and offer support and offer ice cream, it doesn't result in the same thing because the love is there. Yes. Oh, that food. makes powerful sense. Yes. Yeah. Food in the absence of using food to soothe oneself for a child or teenager, again, talking about the developmental trauma piece, um, without the additional support of adults in their life, um, that can lead to emotional eating because you discover that food may be the only um, substance or thing or experience that you can depend on to feel better because it does, it can numb your feelings. But when you've had the support, it's not going to be experienced in the same way and won't necessarily, in my opinion, lead to emotional eating. Fortunately, you had a lot of uh, islands of safety. Well, at least that one island of safety in your family and your, with your friend's family, which is beautiful. Yes. Oh, for sure. I, I definitely had those hashtag one caring adult <laughs> uh, in, yeah, in my right. life from teachers and yes. Um, other other people my grandmother was was a beautiful source of uh support so yeah awesome awesome so when on your book it sounds so much like a guide i mean i i love it that you you have put in uh audios and and in visuals and uh it's just so incredibly powerful to be taken not just like oh here's what happened here's the scientific explanation for it but but just that hand to hold and um yeah so for that again I say thank you as well because I know that's what helps me yeah it's a program really it's um the beginning aspect there's some background information about um all in layperson's terms you know but about the effects of early trauma on our nervous system, on one's nervous system, how the fight, flight, freeze, fawn reaction can get triggered and, you know, fight, fight, flight, people are mostly familiar with that when there's a threat and our bodies react in a way to either fight or flee, which is usually the best thing when you can do that. You can't really do that if you're five years old and your parents are fighting and where are you going to go in your bedroom and put your pillow over your head perhaps, but, and then free fight, flight, and then freeze. Your body becomes immobilized. Um, Your nervous system, your whole mind, body, spirit can become immobilized. And then um, fawn response, that might be a little newer for some people to understand in terms of the um, stress response in the body, fight, flight, freeze. Fawn is more of a behavioral adaptation to stress. It was coined by Peter Walker um, in his book on trauma. And it speaks to those people-pleasing behaviors that get developed early on in childhood to please and appease the adults in one's life where there may be, where you may be afraid, um, afraid of being yelled at, afraid of being abandoned, afraid of being um, somebody being disappointed with you. And those behaviors of pleasing and appeasing, like that term fawning over somebody, can see that in some adults who've been traumatized. So anyway, I addressed in the beginning aspects of the effects of trauma on the nervous system and behavioral aspects of stress, I mean, uh, of early trauma and how that can lead to triggers. Um, I have some techniques for calming the body. I actually, we had done this once before about using a sacred shawl, what I call a sacred shawl, which It's having a shawl that you do a blessing, a spiritual kind of blessing. And I have some phrasing in the book, but you can use any word where you speak to your higher power, speak to your wise self, um, help me feel calm, help me feel at peace, help me feel at ease. And using a shawl as a way to wrap yourself and your wrap you and your body. It's a way, you know how people will use a weighted blanket to experience a sense of security, so to speak. Having a shawl, a go-to shawl to use can also help calm the nervous system down as well. So I address that. Um, And then it goes into connecting with your body. I have some strategies for helping around as it talked about some of those. Um, I address some 
limiting and trauma-based and fear-based beliefs that often come out of having a history of trauma that can lead to emotional eating or all sorts of other addictions as well. But thoughts around lack of self-worth, um, lack of hope, I'll never be able to stop emotionally eating. Or food is food, food are my friends. What will I do if I give them up to cope? So give them up. So there's a whole chapter in a strategy around dealing with limiting beliefs. Um, a chapter on dealing with feelings mindfully as one is the feelings bridge. So I go on to some other experiences. Uh, taking your power back from trigger foods. There's a chapter on trigger foods and some people would, or the way I, I, I define trigger food, are those certain foods that people feel that you may feel have a certain kind of power over you, that they're hard to stop eating once you start. So I, I address that as well. Um, I may go, maybe I'll go into that a little bit more right now. Um, I look at two ways of dealing with trigger foods. I know there's a, a belief that if you put a rule around not, now I'm not a believer in diet culture and saying you can eat this and you cannot eat that. That's, that's, that's not emotionally, in my opinion, a wise thing to do. Although I understand there are certain diet can be used loosely to meaning a way of eating or a certain style of eating. What I'm talking about those res restrictive diets that are, are not necessarily um, supportive really for somebody developing a more peaceful relationship with their body. And so while having a mindset that all foods are legal, so to speak, I think is important. There are many people I've worked with where they feel that if they keep certain foods in their home, it, it is too tempting and it's better for them not to have them in their home. And I certainly support either one because I do think that, um, you know, even people who don't emotionally eat may feel like they are restricting. I'm not going to bring by that because I don't want to just devour that bag of chips. I'd rather just eat them at a party, so to speak. So it's people finding their own way. There's not one right way. You can choose not to have a certain food in your home, and it doesn't have to feel like a restriction if you choose to look at it that way, that you're taking power back. Um, oh, and I have a whole chapter, I'd like to speak about this for a little bit, on transforming self-punishment into self-compassion. Because one of the key aspects of healing emotional eating, and I address this a lot, it's not about not emotionally eating. It's not being able to say, oh, I went a week and I didn't over, I didn't use food to soothe myself, or it's been a month and I didn't use food to soothe myself. The real, because there may be a, a trigger and maybe you do, and that's okay. It's not a sin. It's what you, how you handle it afterwards. So it's not, not emotionally eating or stopping emotionally eating for good, whatever that means, because it doesn't necessarily mean it's for good and you can still heal from it, even if you still emotionally eat from time to time, but it's how you talk to yourself afterwards. So when you get to a point, most people, when they emotionally eat, many people will beat themselves up. Um, they'll feel guilt and shame, self-loathing. As long as you continue to feel those states of being experience those emotions it will be harder to stop emotionally eating and those feelings aren't just about emotionally eating those are very those are core trauma-based feelings and that's where it's really great to use the feeling bridge when when you get to a point where you're not talking to yourself that way where you can or you feel the shame but love yourself with it Notice that this is coming from childhood. It's not just about eating over, you know, eating this wasn't a sin. But once you get to a place where you talk to yourself with greater kindness, self-love, acceptance, and compassion, that's the key or one of the main keys to healing emotionally eat, emotional eating. I hope that makes makes sense. Oh, makes absolutely. Sense. And I, I, I so did it yesterday. And so I'm like giving myself a little woo because... Uh, I've, I've been on this restricted eating because of health reasons I knew, and slowly, yeah. 
slowly adding foods back in. And so it's just been such a, such a joy, very organic still, but it's just wonderful to add these foods back in. So I'm, I'm giving myself little treats every now and then um, just as, just as testing the waters and uh, found this little, this little bag of treats and I ate the whole darn bag yesterday. <laughs> And I was, I actually celebrated because I was like, Terry, you so deserve this. You so, and so it wasn't because normally I would have been like, I can't believe you ate that whole bag and been so hard on myself. Um, And so I, it was, I enjoyed it and even recognized that, oh, I treated myself so kindly just then for allowing myself the, that treat. And um, so, yeah, and it's a wonderful feeling when you are able to celebrate um, or just not celebrate, but treat yourself with, with kindness. Right. Yeah. For when you beat yourself up with guilt, shame, self-loathing, those are three key experiences people might, um, feel, you know, after emotionally eating that could just perpetuate the cycle. You feel that way that can perpetuate more emotionally eating. It's getting, to the place of self-love and self-compassion and the root, the root where that those feelings came from. Because, you know, one difference, people who don't have a, um, a chronic problem with emotionally eating may still emotionally eat sometimes. Lots of people do. The key is they're probably not going to beat themselves up for it. You know? They might say, oh, I, I, you know, that was a little too much or that doesn't always agree with me. I overdid it. But they're generally not going to feel the same level of shame and self-loathing unless they too were traumatized and that's still inside of them. But that is one of the keys for healing, getting uh, to a place where you find that you are not upset with yourself as much, even when you do it, even when you may use food to soothe yourself. That's okay. What's a harder journey and what makes it kind of harder to be on that healing path is the, the beating oneself up, beating of oneself afterwards. Awesome. Well, I know we could sit and talk for probably hours, uh, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to touch upon anything that, that we haven't had a chance to yet. Actually, I would, um, as we were talking about the, as I was talking about the different chapters in my book, I do want to talk about um, one of the last ones is um, it's not, it's creating an emotionally safe sanctuary. And it's about basically decluttering. I'm really excited about it because when I first learned about the power of decluttering, it was in 1999 into 2000, it was a very long time ago. And I read a book by Karen Kingston, Clear Your Clutter with Feng Shui. It transformed my life. And I call clutter clearing self-growth's best kept secret because people don't often use, I, I've been using it a lot now with my in my um, practice with clients. So there's a whole chapter on looking with new eyes at the objects that we own and I'm not just talking, this This is, it's obviously clutter clearing is great for general um, stress reduction and cl- mental clarity even, but I'm talking about things people, uh, two aspects, things people may hold from childhood that without them even being aware of it may remind them or be rooted in some trauma that might be experienced. Maybe there are photographs of people that they were hurt by. Maybe it's a, an object that somebody gave them as a gift, but it was the person that gave it to them was somebody who hurt them in some way. And it can be a little more tricky with parents. I get it. But it's a whole, the chapter is about looking at these things differently. Items you make, even a teddy bear. Um, You know, a teddy bear may have gotten somebody through some rough times. And if it still works to keep it, that's fine. If you cry yourself to sleep holding a teddy bear and you want to hold on to it, that's fine. And it may also be fine to say, I'm not there anymore and release that teddy bear. There's, I I believe, an example in the book where 
um, uh, because I've done this quite a bit with some other clients where there's a burial ritual. Maybe you bury that treddy bear or it could be any kind of stuffed animal or it could be anything from your childhood. But the power of the energy in those objects is really strong. And without our even being aware, the objects in our life are an extension of our energy system. I also talk about not just objects from one's childhood. Again, it trim- could be any, any, all of our child, whether you're traumatized or not, it's kind of a good thing to clear things out because otherwise you're partly rooted in the past and it, in it, in it, um, doesn't allow for all your energy to be in present time to move forward in your life. The other thing I talk about are ways in which you may joke or share memes that joke about emotional eating. And, you know, you see these all the time on Facebook. And I'm like, no, don't be sharing that. Um, there's an, an example in the book of somebody who had a, like a, a cartoon cartoon on their refrigerator that was about a pie calling and no, no, I don't want to hear this. You know, the pie was calling their name and people will joke, you know, chocolate just calls my name. Stop joking about it. Stop having memes that denigrate a challenge that you're really trying to overcome. But this is an, it's not often looked at as a way to help you heal, but it absolutely can just accelerate the process. When you look at the ways in which our language and the the jokes in the spirit of, um, I'm, I'm having a hard time with this so I can joke about it. Sure, it's it can lighten a situation, but when you're doing it a lot, you're stuck there. And by not doing it, it will help you release the, the, the power that challenge has over you, whether it's this or something else. But there's a whole chapter on looking at our belongings and um, memes and whatnot with new eyes in it. It's really powerful. So, wow, you have me thinking as I surround myself with all this stuff. But what, what I popped into my head was when, when my mom passed away in March and um, my sister and I sat in her apartment and going through so much stuff. And my sister was filling up a box with, oh, I want this. I want this. And I, I kept saying, no, thanks. No, thanks. No, I don't want it. No, it's okay. No. And she's like, you're not taking anything with you. I used, I have to fly home, except that when we went for her funeral, we drove. So I had a whole car I could have filled, but I decided, no, no, no. Uh, Why do you think all this? Why do you think you didn't? Um, I, I was ready to let go and let go of her and this this was her stuff this was uh I mean I kept a few little things that were sentimental to me and I did take a couple of things um but I I wasn't filling up boxes and boxes with with my mom's stuff and what I found incredible joy from was she lived in a little retirement community a little um just it was independent living and we talked to the staff there and said hey they have a little community room that they play bingo and in cards and all that stuff. We said, can we put items in that room for the residents that also live here that may need a coffee maker or microwave or whatever? And it was beautiful because oh. here we were surrounded by almost every resident in that building has something of my mom's. And so we said, it's a way for her to continue to be in that, in that, community which she loved so much but to be able to know that her stuff was Mm -hmm. bringing joy or filling a need in all of these people's lives and I was like I I don't need I you know I have my mom in my heart and that in these memories of her and I'm gonna get a little choked up but I don't need all the stuff of hers um so anyway that's what popped into my head that's a great example having some things is one thing but having a lot can just keep you rooted in the past, even when the past was a positive past, but especially if there's been more challenges. And um, it's it's life transforming when we release things that are from 
an earlier time in our life that isn't about who we are today. And again, I'm not talking about everything. We all may want to hold on to certain things that are meaningful, um, but it's very empowering to release things that no longer help us move forward, but in fact can, can keep us stuck. And it's just amazing energetically the new awarenesses that can come into your life when you really get on. I mean, I, earlier in my, during that time, the, whenever that was, the early 20s, I did a major, major decluttering. It's just life transforming. And when I feel stuck in some ways in my life, I know now to go organize something to do. And it's just, even if it's unrelated, doing that, when you think that we are connected by threads of invisible energy to everything in our life, when you start getting rid of those things, new things come in. And I don't, I don't mean new stuff necessarily comes in. New ways of being, maybe new people, maybe new experiences. It's it's really powerful. So I'm excited oh, about having that as a, as a chapter in, in a self-help book, which isn't normally something that you would think of reading. So I'm happy about that. That's I absolutely a- love it because I, I could not agree more. I I I do it. I love it. I, I even have a little ritual when I let it go. Like I just, I'm, I'm sending it off to enjoy, to go bring fulfillment or, or happiness or whatever, a need to, to someone else's life. So yeah. And that's wonderful oh. that your mother's stuff, that her belongings could be used that way. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. That was, it was pretty cool. We, my, my sister and I both teared up quite a number of times when just seeing um, and I know we're kind of going over, but I, I just want to talk about this for a second is that we, there was the, the staff had told us that um, a, a woman had moved in. She had lived there once before. And then her son came in and said, you know, mom, come live with us, went, got rid of all of her stuff. And then he decided, oh, she's too much to take care of. You can go back and live where you were, but she didn't have any of her stuff. And so she had moved in with a bag chair meaning like you know you take to a baseball game and a mattress and that was it and so we were like oh my gosh so we gave her first dibs and brought her down to my mom's place and my mom had this recliner that that I had bought her um that she just absolutely loved and this woman just she was so grateful and she cried we cried and so to be able to give her that oh my god like my I could feel my mom standing there sobbing too you know her spirit because that's what she was about was was giving to others um and yeah so that to me was just beautiful yeah that is lovely that is lovely so there you go all right so how do folks uh find your book? How do they uh, get in touch with you? Can people, can folks work with you if they want? One-on-one. Right now, I'm limiting my practice to only former clients who want to resume therapy, Um, but I will be creating some programs based on the book. They can find me at dianepetrella.com. The book is on Amazon now for, well, I know we're recording this earlier than when it's coming out, but it's on It's on Amazon, Um, but I will be planning to do some programs down the road. So right now, the one on, they could sign up for my newsletter though. And I'll, I know that's a way to stay in touch and be um, able to hear about things that I create. I'd like to perhaps have some online. I have some ideas. I just haven't put them, put them out there yet. So that would be the way to work together one-on-one, not so much at the moment. Okay, wonderful. Well, that yes, sign up for the newsletter, and then you'll know when uh, programs are coming out. So wonderful. All right. Well, Diane, it's just been such a joy to to have you here with me again today. (laughs) Thank you, Terry. It's always a pleasure to uh, to be with you and really your smiling face, which is just always such a joy. Oh, thanks. Made my heart smile. You've got got what? (laughs) You've got a beautiful smile. I've always. Uh, yeah. And I know, I know your your uh, support dog, Sammy, is there with you, but I guess uh, he's been kind of quiet. 
Yeah, she's she's sound asleep behind me, and she's uh, she used to. I said I told you before we hit record. As long as as long as FedEx or Amazon or as anyone isn't pulling in the driveway, she's she's snoozing away. So yeah, I was kind of hoping to hear or see her, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Hey Sam. Nope, she's out. Right. But thank you for um, oh. hosting me today. I appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Thank you for giving, uh, me and my book the opportunity to have people. Um, learn about it. Well, your wisdom, I, t- I tell you, I've learned so much from you and our conversations. And uh, so thank you for, thank you for putting it together in this first book, because <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure there'll be more. So, um, all right. Well, everyone, thanks for joining us today on the Healing Place podcast. And remember until next time, be gentle with yourself. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. Terry Welbrock again. Just wanted to thank you for listening to the episode today and remind you to visit my website as well, terrywellbrock.com. You can sign up for my monthly Hope for Healing newsletter, which is also jam-packed with information and strategies and blog pieces and guest blog pieces and links to shows. Thanks for, again, being here and being a part of this healing space. I very much appreciate you. All right. Bye-bye.